Tony, thanks very much for, for joining us and having a wee chat with me about the um, proposed changes to existing legislation that could be applied to spiking. Um, obviously, both of us have to acknowledge the great work that's been done um, by Don Dines in particular, and to raise the awareness of this. And, um, you know, following on from sort of videos that she did with Ian Fox and Gary Twining Wright, for example, um, again, about promoting the awareness of this. But again, they were, they were more in particular about proposing their requirement for specific legislation to do with spiking. And it's not to directly outrightly contest this, but hopefully the, the, the purpose of today is to explore why perhaps that's not necessary and to see what powers are already in play that could bring someone who is guilty of the offences spiking to justice. Um, so obviously I'm not going to steal your thunder with that one. I'll let you take over the section 61, 23 and 24. Um, but just first, if you don't mind, I basically put this little presentation together, which um, I'm going to make available to anyone that wants it. Um, but more important than that is to perhaps continue this conversation and perhaps get other people involved. Indeed, maybe Dawn Dines would come in herself at some point um, with something new, maybe something's developed since um, previous conversations. So we put this little presentation together. Um, obviously, you've seen it, but, um, but for the benefit of say, folk that want to watch this video, um, we can move on to saying, look, we need a definition, first of all. What are we talking about with spiking? Okay, so this rate crisis um, organization had basically said spiking specifically when someone puts alcohol or drugs into another person's drink or body without their consent. So very, very broad scope there, um, which, which is great. There were some statistics given out, okay, from the from the period of 1st September 2021 to August, or the end of August 2022. And you're looking at just under 5,000 um, known offences. That's the ones that we know about. Well, that's the, which is which is the, you know a, a key and important thing to, to consider. But when you break those statistics down, 64% of the majority of reports happen on weekends, which again is not really unsurprising. Um, Following on from that, 74% identifies female. There's some other statistics there, but we don't need to read this word for word. The people can have this if they want it. So it is obviously, you know, prevalent to say the least. Um, 5,000 offences, 64% happen at weekends, and maybe three quarters identify as female. Okay. So, you know, it's, it's, it's an issue. It does need to be addressed to say the least. Absolutely. Yeah. What are the police doing? So again, it's about engagement and, and, and vigilance, um, which is my angle from this, about, and, and vigilance in particular. So there's a lot more engagement, um, a lot more sort of overt presence that's happening, which, which is great to say the least. But bear in mind, the police are already dutified to look out for other criminality. You know, so they've got a lot, they have to be very vigilant and they've got a lot on their plate day to day. Um, and it's not that they're ignorant to, to spiking in the slightest, but obviously this has just come more to the fore and more of a, a relevant topic. Um, so you see there, you know, they're speaking to visitors, you know, working closely with Fryson's premises and um, more plain closed officers are in there. OK, looking for sort of behavioural patterns that may perhaps have hostile intent, you know, but someone who's intended to spike someone. The interesting one they've claimed is that there's more um, activity within the, the CCTV suites, the ops rooms and the control rooms, which you and I both know if, if you're going to have directed surveillance that way, then it has to be justified. So there's a wee, there perhaps could be a delay before information is relayed to someone to, to action um, against someone who could actually maybe spike in. Um, engaging with licensed taxis, bars and clubs, again, fantastic. Um, welfare organisations, street pastors, increasing searches which, you know, that, that's obviously something that is a bony contention with society at the moment, stop and search, et cetera, et cetera, and profiling, all these sort of type of things. So there's a lot for the police to sort of carry on a day-to-day -day basis, especially at the weekends. Um, but the big thing is about obviously reporting these so the statistics can be um, reinforced, shall we say. What steps can, can you take um, when, when you believe someone is possibly being spiked? Well, this comes from the, the drink safe. So again, we, we need to recognize that there's organizations out there who are very active in getting information out there. So we're not going to steal their thunder. I think the best thing to do is to acknowledge their work and, and, and share their work, you know. Some of these things here um, obviously are easier to do than others. Um, and people are out there obviously just looking to enjoy themselves, to say the least, and they may become, their inhibitions may be reduced. They may feel safe amongst friends, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but never leaving your drink unattended is, is a, you know, a pretty obvious one. Because um, at the same time, Tony, you probably agree, people don't want to go out and think they're 
going to suffer violence or, or, or criminality or they want to go out and enjoy themselves. So they're going out with a positive attitude, hopefully. So it's, it's important yep. people going to go out with this fear around the bubble, but but being aware and, and being self-aware and situationally aware, which we could talk about all day. Um, but a couple of things that are coming out here, which which I think is um, very interesting, is down the bottom there, towards the bottom, it says, be familiar with what you're consuming. A lot of folk, you know, the, the power of taste, smell and textures and things like that, are, it's, they really are important. Same with your situation or sort of bigger part in your environment. You know, some people just know temperatures, smells, for example, and they identify that with certain venues or places. And that can either be a negative experience or a positive experience. So it's the idea of going to places you're always familiar with and maybe you feel a bit more confident with. Avoid drinking yeah. too much. Well, we can all uh, we can all agree with that one. Buying yeah. your drink and watching it being poured, ideal, that's fantastic. Maybe not always practical, though, unfortunately. And the reason I've left this one to last is because you get a lot of these protective caps now. Um, one's a cup or drink safe. There's many other ones available on the market. Um, and, and obviously they are they're very useful, very important. Again, the idea of having to go out every single time in your, for the rest of your life and have these in your pockets and putting them over your bottles and things, it's just you not know, the best socialization or experience from a going out and enjoying yourself perspective. You know, thinking every time I go out here, I need to be protected against every member of society because they're out to harm me. It's it's not the best attitude to have, but unfortunately, we have to counter that with the threat and risk um, of, of spiking, which, which is, 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 is prevalent. So moving on, though, quickly, because we don't want to dwell a lot of time on this one. If you think a friend has been spiked, basically, what can you do? There's, you know, signs and symptoms. These are not exhaustive, and this comes from the Drink Aware um, organization, so I'll to, to acknowledge that with them. Lord inhibitions, loss of balance, feeling sleepy, so on and so forth. Again, it's that communication and acting quickly. That's what this really comes down to. Um, if you're acting on that honestly held belief, I don't think anyone's going to criticise you for it, to say the least. You know, um, looking out for your, your your mucker, shall we say, or looking out for the person you're, you're out with, you know, looking after each other. Um, these things are invaluable, to say the least. But again, reporting things quickly and acting on things rather than just letting them sort of go on and perhaps progressively get worse. This was um, obviously all this stuff comes from the, the NPCCC. And uh, on the 29th of December 2022, the release, they basically said advice on what you do if you think you've been spiked yourself. So there are these organizations around, okay, obviously call 99901 to report to the police because they want to know, to say the least, okay, and they want to support you. Um, you can just phone 11, but we also have that ability to report it more anonymously through the SARCs, okay, the Sexual Assault Referral Centres. So they can have an, a forensic examination, but they, you know whether you want to report to the police or not. So you can just know for yourself um, and eliminate any doubt or just maybe try and find some reassurance that you've not been spiked. Or if you have, then obviously you have the autonomy to decide what you want to do next, which is, which is very important. So again, these organisations are down there. So your guy here moving more towards you now, Tony. Um, your guy, Richard Graham, an MP who is petitioning for spiking to become a criminal offence in its own right. And the point of this video today is to basically explore the powers that are already in play, as I said. It raises the question, has populism trumped proper legislative purpose? Okay, and I know you're going to move on to other examples of law that have basically come into play based on sort of populism, shall we say. I have to acknowledge the contribution made here from the Mountford Chambers, because um, they put a, a little bit out there on this on the 29th um, of June there, and there was just last year. So the guy here, um, move over, is from Chambers, your Mark Watson, and he had basically mentioned that, that there has been um, proposed changes or, or, or agreed you know, there is going to be a review on this police crime sentencing and courts bill. And it was given royal assent on the 28th of April to basically review specifically under the Sexual Offences Act, which basically, you know, narrows things a bit here, which I know you're going to talk about. Um, why, why did they specifically pick that act, to say the least, okay, when the sections 23 and 24 are perhaps more broad spectrum to give you the, the, the powers to, to act on this? So the reviews expected to last a year, but we're expecting it any time now, especially with the the popularity of this topic, shall we say, and and, and bringing us to the fore. I dare say there will be pressures to get something out there. 
But your other guy, Jason Harwin, who I now believe is working directly with Don Dines, um, he's, I think he's now left the force, um, he has basically been quoted as saying, my personal view is that we need a separate offence for it because it highlights the importance of this crime. And secondly, for me, importantly, it shows the importance that we see in terms of we need to do everything we can to stop it in the first place. But my question, with all due respect, is does the, the, the raising of or, or bringing in new legislation automatically make people more vigilant? Um, because we still have the requirement for gathering evidence, which I believe is something you're going to talk about anyway. So do we need new legislation just to highlight the importance? Um, maybe that's not what he's saying. I just sort of interpreting it that, that that's from what I read there. You know, I, I think we need to explore more um, about what's already in place. That's that's my whole point. So my last comment there is, are reasons and opinions such as these enough to warrant new independent legislation? As it stands today, Tony, I'll, I'll, I'll open this and say I don't think it does. Um, and that's not to directly challenge um, for any other reason that, that I, I'm just looking to try and bring awareness to people that there are current legislations in place that, that could be used. And I would argue that the new specific legislation is perhaps not required. And if it is required or they can bring something else that's not already there, then keep an open mind to that. And, and let's just see what comes out, you know, absolutely. Um, so. I'll be, before I hand over to you, I'm just going to let people aware of who you are, Tony. So Tony Power, okay, you are a lawyer. Um, so people may be wondering who is this guy. <laughs> so who better than to ask a lawyer, okay? So you are a lawyer, and you are now an academic tutor at Canterbury Christ Church University. And I think you've been there some time now, haven't you? In, involved with quite a few people. Um, yeah, I've done my law degree here. Um, uh, graduated in 2019 as a mature student um, and then from there I became a, a sessional lecturer and I'm now full-time since December as an academic tutor in law mm -hmm. um, so I have teaching responsibilities um, you know including criminal law as well. Absolutely but you've got a bit more than that Tony and uh, you've been a bit conservative with this because yep. I see you <laughs> here um, but you are former frontline police and you are also a former Care sector worker, would that be correct? Yep, yeah, um, I was a cop for 16 years, uh, Northumbria here in Kent, and then uh, back home in Hampshire. Um, I took a career break and worked uh, directly as a specialist childcare manager, um, but also got lent to uh, dementia homes as well. Figure that one out. Um, and when I was medically retired from the police in 2013, that's when I um, started in power and training consultancy. Um, my long-standing relationship with NFPS um, and you and Travel, um, and through the likes of Travel and Mark Dawes, um, I ended up becoming a um, expert witness in use of force, uh, challenging behaviour, with also a bit of a specialism in autism and Asperger's. Um, so yeah, I gained the Cubs accreditation, so Cardiff University Bon Solon accreditation, back in 2014. And I'm um, an accredited expert for both civil and criminal courts. I will just point out I'm an academic lawyer and lawyer in the English sense of the word. I'm not a barrister, I'm not a solicitor, but I am a member of the Chartered Institute of Legal Executives. <laughs> I, th I think it's fair that I don't think anyone's going to challenge your, your credibility and their ability to <laughs> an opinion on this subject, to say the least. But um, yeah. look, I'm not going to steal your thunder, and um, this is all your stuff here. And if you just want me to tell me to go into the next slide, uh, I shall do so. But I'll hand over to you because yeah. I know section 24 is not shown there, that's in the next slide. But Tony, yeah. just, just basically to open the question straight to it is what, in your opinion, is already in play that is suitable and sufficient to bring a potential person who would be guilty of the offence of stalking, is it a big of spiking, uh, yeah. to justice? Okay. And yeah, please share your comments on it. Yeah, uh, by all means. So um, I will just reiterate what you said earlier, Rab. Um, we, this is in no way um, going against the work that Dawn has done and the drive for spiking to be made illegal. Um, my point is that 
it is already illegal when we look at standing law and we do fully support Dawn in her work. But my fear is that the government um, will leap on this and um, create a, an offence or a piece of legislation that satisfies populism. I'll, I'll come on to that in a little bit. Sure. Looking at the standing law that we have, um, as it says there, arguably the offence is already there. So we look at Section 161 of the Sexual Offences Act 2003. And to mm -hmm. read it, you know, a person commits an offence if he or she intentionally administers a substance to cause um, or to cause substance be taken by person B. Person B does not consent and person A intends to overpower the person in order to engage in sexual activity with person B. So that's looking at it from the sexual offensive um, aspect. Now, you did point out something quite interesting earlier um, with Mark Watson. He refers to a government review of spiking under the Sexual Offences Act. Now, the problem with Section 61 is, yes, it covers a particular area, but it looks like there's a gap in legislation because it's purely down to sexual um, intent. Yeah. I know from my time as frontline cop, I, I've dealt with spiking, and it is awful. It's horrible. And people who engage in it really do deserve everything they uh, that they get it's the coward's way of doing stuff um but there in fact there is no gap in the legislation because we come on then to what the victorians came up with so if you're thinking spiking's new probably it's not um or <laughs> in its current form yes but in um other ways administering something that's noxious goes back to the victorians so we have section 23 of the offenses against persons act um a lot of people think that the Offences Against Persons Act is a new piece of legislation. It's not. It's from 1861. Now, the um, Victorian legislators wrote that you know it's a uh, it's an offence to unlawfully and maliciously administer or to cause to be administered or to uh, to be taken by another person any poison or other destructive or noxious thing so as to thereby endanger their life or cause grievous bodily harm. So people may think that's quite an extreme view, but when you look at the stuff that is being injected into people or being dropped into their drinks, um, some of the um, powders, pills, etc., that are placed into drinks, people are allergic to them. So we're looking at grievous bodily harm anyway because of you know something like anaphylaxis or other reaction to the drug that they've been given. Also, some of the drugs that are given, they, the people that administer them really don't know what they're giving. So they, they may be a go-between between the person who's trying to sort of push the drugs or whatever. So if we're looking at serious organised crime, and some of these things, if you mix them immediately with alcohol, it increases their potency, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, Again, people may argue that Section 23 is limited. So if you go on to the next slide, Rab, we have Section 24 of the Act, and it makes an offence to do exactly the same, but the intent is amended to injure, annoy, or aggrieve the other person. Yep. Now, this is significant, as we don't need the consequential harm or endangerment as per Section 23. So despite the sort of change in the sort of group's bodily harm to annoy, agree, or um, injure, we are still looking at two significant parts of legislation that hold quite a significant sentence as well, okay? Um, they are indictable offences. So therefore, we already have standing legislation. And so technically spiking comes under those definitions. So we actually have a complete offence. So like you, Rab, I find it difficult for Suella Bravman to start saying she's introducing new legislation to deal with an offence that there's already legislation to deal with. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I can think of for this be pushed. Now, the MP who is uh, put it through as a private bill 
yes, he may have very good intent, but for the government to then take it up, I'm, I'm worried that this is populism. Now, populism trumping legislative purpose has happened many times in history. Mm -hmm. um, we look at Harper's Law and the Assault on Emergency Workers Act. Now, I, I was one of the people who initially backed this, but then when I saw what the legislation was doing, I was a little bit, a little bit annoyed because there seemed to be a lot of harping on from the government. I'm not trying to be political here either, but there was a lot of harping on from the government saying, oh, look, aren't we wonderful? But Harper's Law didn't really change much. Yes, it introduced mandatory life, um, uh, life sentences for the offence, um, where that previously wasn't the position. But again, to prove that point so that the mandatory life offence was there hasn't changed from standing legislation anyway. Okay. Now, one of the other things is when you create legislation like this on top of standing legislation, it causes confusion. And mm. um, the fear is then that the legislation isn't necessarily robust enough. So if you go on to the next slide, I'll, I'll point out a couple of things there. Um, when you have legislation on top of legislation, because they're not talking about repealing anything from the Offences Against Persons Act. So therefore we have legislation on legislation. You do start doing that and we end up in a situation where we have to wait for case laws for clarity. And unfortunately that leaves gaps and loopholes. So therefore the, the law isn't seen as being efficient, it's seen as not working. And that by, by rote will then harm the ethical drive of what the campaigners are originally going for. And it seems to shift the focus from the drive of what is being sought by the likes of Dawn to the government, now either positive or negatively. I mentioned about populism before. It's not a new thing. Um, as I mentioned there, the Magna Carta was a populist move by King John. You look at the time of Margaret Thatcher, some of the laws that were brought in during that time were populist to the supporters of the Tory government. Um, other laws have been released where it is a popular thing to do because, oh, look, aren't we great? We're doing something about it. But legislating in this way is actually inherently dangerous. Um, it's not a process rooted in principle, but it's reactive, as in the case of Harper's Law. That was um, down to the dissatisfaction of verdicts and specific sentencing exercise. So. You know, I really don't want to sound philosophical, but our criminal justice system entrusts the trial and sentencing to independent parties, the jury. Okay. The bill has yet to find its final, final form. So I can't, you know, I'm, I'm a person who never says never. It may be that the legislators do actually put something in there that is very helpful. But from my experience of being a cop on the streets and dealing with stuff like this, I can't see what else can be done. Being quite hard here, if you go on to the next slide, mm -hmm. whenever we look at any criminal offence, we must have evidence. So, to secure a prosecution, you've got to have, for example, say spiking. Has the app been witnessed? A lot of the time, it hasn't. Is there forensic evidence? Well, if they've ingested a drug, you're not going to get any fingerprints, or you know, it's been in liquid anyway. Very rarely that they, they will touch the drinking vessel. So forensically, the evidence is very difficult. So we turn to CCTV, and as you were saying earlier, there are um, bits of legislation around that as to what CCTV can be used, how it is seized, etc. So CCTV is a latter part. So unless there's someone sat there watching it, you know, we, we lose evidence there as well. Please, please, please don't take this as, evidence, uh, as blaming any of the victims. 
they really truly are the innocent one innocent ones here um one of my colleagues one time we went into a nightclub that thankfully is no longer there here in kent i came out and there was a needle stuck in my body armor they also tried it on my colleague they missed the body armor and hit him he collapsed um he was very very ill for a very long time so you know i do understand that you know it is not the victim's fault in any way shape or form but the issue of evidence will remain the same whether we stick with the legislation we have or whether spiking is an offense on its own sadly that is the cold hard facts of any criminal investigation so pretty much in summary we have standing law i understand the ethical drive and the reason behind the you know the push for the, from the likes of dawn um to have spiking recognized but my issue is it may actually in my opinion do harm to the the drive of this and the whole reason the, the rationale behind it by turning it into a separate piece of legislation I've seen, you know, through case law and teaching this stuff, that when you have a new piece of legislation just sat on top of standing legislation, as I mentioned earlier, it creates loopholes, it creates gaps, it creates confusion. And all you get is the government going, thank you very much, we've done this, aren't we wonderful? Whereas the actual crime is still going on and nothing really changes. So I don't personally, from my point of view, I don't think new legislation is going to actually raise the awareness sufficiently enough. You know, it, it, unfortunately, with populist moves um, previously, there's a flash in the pan and then it dies away because the government move on to something else. This, you know, it is something horrible. It does need to be dealt with. And I think it's more about training and awareness. Um, I mean, Rab, you know, what are your thoughts on that? I think um, you hit the nail on the head there from, the, well, from, from my perspective. Um, I think there's no substitute for training and awareness um, or training in awareness, behavioural analysis being one of them, for example, um, especially by, you know, um, bar staff and, of course, right up to the police itself or anybody that's dealing with the nighttime economy um, in particular. So... But what type of training is a conversation out with the scope of, of today's chat? But I think no matter what we try and propose today, I think, in, especially in terms of gathering evidence and, you know, how do you take custody of that evidence, the continuity of evidence or the integrity of the evidence, um, all that would start from vigilance and, and catching it as it happened real time. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's interesting you're saying certain things. You go back to the 1861 Act. Is it cold? I'm sorry, is, is, is it too old, etc.? I don't know what um, advantages there are going to be of, as you say, compounding legislation and possibly creating sort of loopholes that would perhaps fail on a, a technical basis in a court of law. And yeah. is it going to just confuse the thing? And ultimately, where I'm going with my, my comment is that perhaps justice won't actually be served on a potential person who's who's been accused of the offence of stalking and as such the victim won't get justice either um so again that could be a conversation on its own right but also what's sentencing um is there enough sentencing powers if someone is convicted again that's a conversation that could be had outside of this and maybe perhaps that's what dawn and 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 her team are, are looking at perhaps the threshold tests are not are, are too strict perhaps or not strict enough and perhaps the sentencing is not punitive enough um again all we're trying to do today is make people more aware of the current legislation but before we even get to legislation back to your original question is what do we do and and to me it is about vigilance and training and awareness to this we already have things like the protect duty coming in the prevent strategy and contest strategy things for people looking out for other things like radicalization and other hostile behaviors this is just a natural synergy this is just something that should be integrated as part of that you know, if your gut's saying someone's acting suspiciously, act on it. That is simply what it comes down to. And I don't think anyone, including the police, are going to look badly upon you for using time and resources um, when you genuinely believe something was, you know, not right. Simple as that. 
one of the one of the terminologies we use is absence of the, the normal and, and presence of the abnormal. And that, that comes but also just going from you know the point of legislation, when it, you know this would sort of fall, you know, because we're looking at section uh, twenty three and twenty four of the Offence Against the Persons Act. Yeah. So we're looking sort of self defence law here as well. So we're looking at honest held belief, mm -hmm. which would feed into you know if you see act. So no court is going to criticise anyone from an honest held belief, Absolutely. you know, and you know justifiable, reasonable, and proportionate from any action taken. Um, I will just pick up on one point you said there about old law. Yes, 1861 is a long time ago, um, but from case law, you go through case law of any of the offences against the persons, um, there hasn't really been a successful challenge to the legislation because it's so well written and it is written sufficiently broad enough to capture, um, you know, <laughs> to capture the offences. I mean, obviously, the legislators back in 1861 weren't contemplating someone walking around with a needle or dropping, you know, heroin or whatever into a drink. But for them to actually write, and I'm just wondering, the, um, you know, unlawfully and uh, maliciously administer or cause to be administered or taken by any other person, any poison or destructive or noxious thing, um, so as thereby to endanger life or cause groups bodily harm um, or injure or grieve or annoy any other person. Barristers and lawyers have been looking at this for years and no one has changed that wording. There hasn't been a change to that wording yeah. since 1861. The reason being, some of the finest legal minds have looked at this and gone, actually, it fits. Yeah. So, yes, it is old legislation, but there's pieces of old legislation that, yes, quite rightly are dumped and superseded. But there are bits of old legislation that we keep today because they work. Absolutely. Um, you know, I've, I have done many people. I have you know, prosecuted many, prosecuted. I have arrested many people. Um, under Section 23 and 24 of the Offence Against Persons Act. And I can quite happily say very few of those got off. And the ones that did get off was because of lack of substantial evidence. Sure, sure. And again, focusing on your, your self-defence legislation, and things that one thing we can apply to this is about being proactive as well as reactive, you know, and having things in place that make it more difficult for people who wish to spike people make it more difficult for them, you know, is, and, and you can be environmental changes and venue changes to sort of make sure that that vigilance or a higher level of vigilance can be achieved. And yeah. again, it, it should just be a natural progression from all the other sort of welfare and safeguards that a venue should offer as part of their duty of care to their, to their patrons, shall we say, you know, but just lastly then, and thanks for that, Tony, is um, the last slide we put up was basically, so if changing the law is, is not the case, what, you know, what can be done? And these are some of the things that were basically put out there, more training. So it comes back to this vigilance training, vigilance training. But I guess also auditing that training and part of the protect strategy is, uh, protect duty, sorry, is to evidence what changes you're making, you know, to try and achieve a, a better purpose of ideally welfare and safeguarding of the people you've got that duty of care for. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just liaising with people who are directly in contact with those who may be victim of spiking. Um, and raising that awareness. So, if anything today, we've, we've, we've uh, just perhaps give a reason for other people to, to engage with the subject of spiking. Um, right. And obviously, there, there'll be links to this at the bottom in terms of if anybody wants the copy of these slides, if they're used to anyone, they're welcome to, or if they just want to make comments, engage. Perhaps Don Dines would want to come on and have a chat another time, um, if, if you'd be open to that, Tony. And, uh, oh, just, I yeah. absolutely. Great, it would just be interesting to see where this goes. I do believe it. I think Ian Fox, when he was chatting to uh, Don along with Gary, I think, if memory serves me right, I think he had a, a similar opinion to ourselves that the current sort of powers that, that are in play are suffice to to bring people who are offending, are offending under spiking um, to justice. And, 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 you know, I think that is where we're at today. So... It's, it's out to other people now to you know, contest what we're saying there or perhaps make us aware of things you and I are not aware of. Um, and but, just keep a positive spin on this and keep it constructive and, and moving forward, you know? 
The one thing that I would like to come from this, Rab, is for it to remain in the public eye. Yeah. Because being, you know, people being aware of spiking, of what it is, we have the discussions about the law by all means, but if we achieve, you know, people being more aware of spiking, then I'm happy. I'm more than happy to have conversations with Dawn and anyone else. You know, as I said at the beginning, this is not me wanting to put the brakes on it or you wanting to put the brakes on it. We fully support um, Dawn in her amazing work. And if we can think of a different way to get the, the message out there, rather than, you know, um, having the government have a win with a, a piece of legislation, um, then by all means, I'm more than happy to have that conversation and more than happy to um, <laughs> lend my support to stuff as well. Oh, likewise. But Tony, listen, that's um, that's probably more than enough for, for, for people to, to swallow for today. But uh, thanks very much yep. for you, everybody. Um, no. Let's see what comes out of that. And uh, I'll speak to you soon, my friend. Will do. You take care, buddy. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.